weapons that killed nearly 50 people. And the Sudan breaks ties with Chad, accusing it of supporting rebels and attacked Khartoum. Hello and welcome to News Hour 60 Minutes News Live on CCTV International. I'm Li Dongming in Beijing. The Olympic torch relay continues in East China's Fujian province, and this morning the flame has been passed around the port city of Quanzhou, the second leg of the relay in the province. Li Ying has more. After the relay in the provincial capital of Fuzhou, the flame arrived in the port city of Quanzhou last night. Coupled with this morning's pleasant weather, the local residents' enthusiasm for the flame was tangible everywhere. The starting ceremony of this morning's relay was held outside the museum holding exhibitions on the historical ties between Taiwan and the Chinese mainland. As part of the ceremony, the torch was handed to the secretary of CPC Quanzhou City Committee, Xu Gang, much to the great pride of the crowds and the whole city. The first torchbearer today was Wang Jiasheng, a veteran track and field coach and also an excellent athlete. He was a member of the province delegation at several consecutive national games and won silver in the jump competition at the inaugural national track and field tournament for university students. I was so excited to be the first to run today. I'm also greatly honored to be able to spread the Olympic spirit of peace and friendship on behalf of 7 million Quanzhou people. All the 108 torchbearers who ran in this leg shared the same sentiments. And running was not enough for some of the young torchbearers. They jumped and galloped while continuing to wave at the cheering crowd. Aged from 15 to 74, the torchbearers came from all walks of life, but they all shared the same enthusiasm for the first Summer Olympics to be hosted by China. The theme of the relay in Quanzhou was a journey through history, a fitting tribute to the city's heritage as one of the earliest state council designated historical and cultural cities in China Quanzhou was the starting point of the Silk Road on sea in ancient times. It also enjoys the reputation of a living museum of world religions, boasting many splendid Buddhist temples as well as mosques. The city is also home to the world's first UNESCO-designated demonstration center of diversified cultures. Quanzhou and the Taiwan region are also separated by narrow straits, and many Taiwan compatriots can trace their origins back to Quanzhou. The city is also the hometown of over 7 million overseas Chinese scattered around the world. Leah, CCTV. And the Olympic flame is scheduled to visit the Fujian province coastal city of Xiamen this afternoon. And now let's take a brief look at the city. Xiamen is on the Taiwan Strait and the borders Quanzhou to the north. It was named China's most livable city last year. Because it's shaped like an egret, Xiamen is called Island of Egrets. It is famous for being an ancestral home to overseas Chinese. As one of China's first special economic zones in the 1980s, Xiamen is a favorable destination for foreign investors. Last year's volume of imports and exports hit nearly 40 billion U.S. dollars. And the city is also well known for sports. The Xiamen International Marathon Games, first held in 2003, has become one of China's famous sports events. Many foreigners are taking part in the domestic leg of the Beijing Olympic torch relay. Liu Ying brings us the story of a Dutch torchbearer in this afternoon's Xiamen relay on his devotion to promoting the Chinese language and traditional Chinese culture in the West. This is the library of the Western Belvedere located on the campus of Fuzhou University. Founded in 2003 by renowned Dutch sinologist Christopher Schipper, the library aims to promote Chinese people's understanding of Western culture. Professor Christopher Schipper has spent 50 years studying and promoting traditional Chinese culture. 
The 73-year-old sinologist is a recipient of the Friendship Medal, the top honor granted to foreigners in China. I hope that thanks to my publications and my work and my teaching in France at the University of Paris and at all kind of universities through the world, I have been able to make people understand China. And I think that through understanding, there is real friendship. Professor Shipper has lived in China for more than 20 years and is well versed in Chinese. He says he's greatly honored to be one of the Olympic torch bearers in the salmon leg of the relay in Fujian province. I think that uh, what is really important this time, you know, is what they say, huh? So I'm part of this shuji and I'm also part of that monk, huh? of that dream, sure. Professor Shipper is about to start a major translation project. With support from the Chinese government, Shipper and many other translators will make a new translation of Wu Jing, or the five classics, in 12 different languages. Wu Jing was translated in English and French over 100 years ago, but is not available anymore. Professor Shipper sees the undertaking as a historic milestone. He believes it is a meaningful way to enhance understanding and friendship between China and the rest of the world. Liu Ying, CCTV, Fuzhou, Fujian Province. And jubilant crowds cheered on Sunday as the Olympic torch ran through Fuzhou, the over 2,000 euro capital of Fujian province. And like Xiamen, the port city of Fuzhou is also known as the hometown of many overseas Chinese. Xie Chen has more. The torch was just a boost that people were looking for on a Sunday morning. Crowds cheered as 208 runners undertook the 28-kilometer relay. Olympic volleyball champion Zheng Meizhu lit the torch of her former teammate Hou Yuzhu, and Zheng said she couldn't find the words to express her excitement. <laughs> Their team triumphed at the Los Angeles Olympics in 1984. The eldest torchbearer running in this leg of the relay was a 94-year-old, and a Fuzhou resident conveyed the atmosphere along the route. Everyone is so excited. They are cheering and shouting. There hasn't been a feeling like this in a very long time. At my age, I can't remember seeing anything this exciting. Crowds in China have been turning out in the hundreds of thousands, even millions, just to see the torch go by and it will have traveled a total of 97,000 kilometers by the time it reaches the Bird's Nest Stadium in Beijing on August the 8th. This is by far the longest torch relay in the history of the Olympics. Zhejiang CCTV.
other news, Myanmar's official media says the death toll from Cyclone Nagas has risen to over 28,000. More than 33,000 people are missing. Desperate survivors leave the Irrawaddy Delta looking food, water and medicine. Eight workers say thousands will die if emergency supplies don't reach them soon. Li Xiang reports. Labuda is the only high ground in a vast watery area. It's a haven for thousands of people who survived the last weekend cyclone. Most are lost homes and family members. The town was battered by the cyclone. Eighty percent of homes were destroyed. Buddhist temples and schools on the fringes of the cyclone's trail of destruction are now makeshift refugee centers. Survivors are fending for themselves, huddling together in these shelters. I want to leave Labuta. I don't want to stay here because it is very sad and it is very hard to live here. Authorities provide one cup of rice per family per day. More food was reaching Myanmar's hungry cyclone victims on Sunday as roads were cleared of fallen trees. But international aid groups have warned up to 1.5 million people face death if they do not get clean water and sanitation soon. I lost everything. I lost my family. I need to live. I need to eat. I need something to go on living. I need help. Myanmar's government is accepting aid from the outside world, including the United Nations. But foreign logistics teams are still not allowed in. The UN World Food Program has begun moving aid to its field headquarters in Labuta, using trucks provided by its partners in Myanmar. The latest assessment by the UN Humanitarian Agency says between 1.2 million and 1.9 million people are struggling to survive in the aftermath of the storm that struck eight days ago. Lisa, CCTV. And electricity has been restored to some parts of Yangon. Myanmar's biggest city was heavily damaged by Cyclone Nagas. The power supply to important facilities such as airports, key media and hospitals, as well as some residential communities, are back to normal. Yangon municipal officials also say 95% of the water supply has been restored. An aircraft carrying relief supplies from China has arrived in the cyclone-hit Myanmar city of Yangon, and this is the third batch of relief sent by China. The latest cargo plane to arrive carried 58 tons of supplies, including tanks and water purifiers. China has also sent earlier shipments of food and blankets, part of the country's emergency relief aid of 1 million US dollars and 30 million RMB, the equivalent of 4.3 million. US dollars and China's embassy says Chinese companies in Myanmar have so far donated more than half a million US dollars. After witnessing the seriousness of the disaster, Chinese companies in Myanmar were quick to offer assistance. CMPC China National Petroleum Corporation donated 300,000 US dollars. Sinuk, China National Offshore Oil Corporation, and Sinopec, China Petrochemical Corporation, each donated $100,000, and other companies have also pledged donations. In the U.S., search efforts for missing people are continuing after a tornado spun across the Oklahoma-Missouri border. At least 23 people, 22 people have been killed. In Missouri and Georgia, the tornado has killed 15 people, and a number may rise. Communication links to the area are bad, and at least 80,000 residents are without electricity. Seven people were killed in Pitcher, Oklahoma, where a 24-block area has been virtually destroyed. Hundreds of others have been injured, and crews and search dogs hunted on Sunday for survivors or bodies in the piles of debris. China's health ministry says the hand foot mouth disease outbreak in Fuyang City of East China's Anhui province is under control and the ministry says no fatalities were reported from May the 2nd to May the 10th in Fuyang. It says the majority of critically ill patients there have recovered. The ministry is urging health departments around the country to make all out efforts to prevent HFMD infections. Health officials are asked to pay special attention to kindergartens, primary schools, hospitals, food outlets, and families with children. You're watching NewsHour on CCTV International. Still ahead, 
five days of gun battles between rival groups in Lebanon killed 49 people. And Sudan severs relations with Chad after its capital Khartoum is attacked by rebels from Darfur. Opposition supporters and government loyalists are continuing to fight in Lebanon despite a ceasefire agreement between rival leaders. Sun Sui has more. Shiites loyal to the Lebanese opposition group Hezbollah battled Druze supporters of the ruling coalition in Alay, a town in the mountains overlooking Beirut and nearby villages, on Sunday. At least five people were killed and 12 wounded, bringing the number of dead in five days of fighting throughout Lebanon to 49. Druze leader Walid Jumblat has called for a halt to the fighting and for the army to take control of the mountains. He has also called on Tala Erslan, another Druze leader ally to Hezbollah, to mediate an end to the fighting and hand over the mountain region to Lebanese troops. Peace for civilians, a peaceful coexistence and putting an end to war and destruction is about all else. The clashes came a day after Hezbollah accused followers of Walid Jumblat of killing two of their supporters and kidnapping a third. In a nationwide televised address, Erslan announced he would take over negotiating a ceasefire in the Druze Mountains. Zeng Sui, CCTV. And the Arab League has decided to send a high-profile mission to Beirut to help mediate. The Qatar-based organization says Qatar's prime minister and the head of the Arab League will head the delegation. League Secretary General Amar Musa says the mission will try to bring about a return to dialogue, and this includes an Arab League initiative to end the political stalemate between government and opposition. <laughs> This means that there is an agreement among the Lebanese political class before these events on the question of electing a president and the makeup of a national unity government. What happened was a rupture after the latest events, and we want to resume this political dialogue. Sudan has severed relations with Chad, accusing it of supporting Darfur rebels who assaulted the capital Khartoum. A curfew was lifted in Khartoum but remained in effect in Omdurman, the northern gate of the capital. More than 300 rebels have been reportedly arrested. A Sudanese government spokesman says the attack means political leaders will have to reevaluate Khartoum's relations with Chad. Sudanese authorities are warning residents on the Sudan-Chad border to be aware of possible retaliatory attacks. And UN officials say security teams in Darfur are closely monitoring developments. Serbia's pro-Western President Boris Tadic has declared victory in parliamentary elections. And Sunday's vote is seen as a showdown between nationalists and pro-Western forces over whether Serbia should continue to integrate with the EU or pursue closer ties with Russia. Mike Patterson has more. I mean the prime, uh, the, the Tadic calls Sunday's win convincing and says it shows the majority of Serbia's citizens want to join the EU. This evening is the main question who is going to be our coalition partner. And after this I'm going to find who is going to be our candidate for prime minister. 
Right now I'm going to negotiate with a possible coalition partners. Thank you very much and this is a great victory for Serbia. The voter turnout was about 60 percent. That's lower than January's presidential election, but strong for a parliamentary vote. The elections were called in March after a split between Tadic and Serbian Prime Minister Vojislav Kocunica. They both opposed Kosovo's independence declaration, but differ over their policies toward the EU. The nationalists are represented by the Serbian Radical Party and the coalition of Kostanica, Serbian Democratic Party and New Serbia. They strongly oppose Serbia's further integration with the EU. However, the Democrats say joining the EU is the only way to attract investment, create jobs and raise living standards. It remains unclear exactly what combination of parties would form a government. Mike Patterson, CCTV. You're watching NewsHour on CCTV International Ahead. In business news, China's securities regulator freezes 120,000 stock accounts it says are unqualified. And China moves forward in developing its own large passenger jets for the launch of a new company in Shanghai. In ancient times, those who controlled the central plains controlled China. In modern times, those who choose Xinjiang choose success. Xinjiang, China. Happy China, wonderful Jilin. Yangtze Free Gorges, Shennong Jia, Wudang Mountain, Three Kingdoms Relics, Wuhan Metropolitan Area. Welcome to Hubei. Olympics in Beijing, travel in China. China International Travel Mark 2008 in November, Shanghai. Ideal place to relax, Hangzhou. place to relax, Hangzhou. Sichuan, land of abundance, home of the panda. Happy China, wonderful Jilin. Sichuan, land of abundance, home of the panda. Delicate products. Creating a brilliant future together. The best of Chinese machinery, hardware mode, Chang'an, Dongguan, China.
intimate rendezvous with nature, Putushan, China. Delicate products. Creating a brilliant future together. The best of Chinese machinery, hardware mill, Chang'an, Dongguan, China. An intimate rendezvous with nature, Putushan, China. Lean onto your body and true love. They can be no distance. In love's true moments, the Chinese color is my only choice. True love for real man. The seven brand Chinese color. True love series. CCTV9, China's only English language news channel, broadcasts throughout China and across the globe. CTV Golden Bridge is CCTV International's exclusive advertising agent and can put your company in touch with an audience of millions. Welcome back to Niza. Before we go on, a reminder of today's top stories. Enthusiastic crowds gather in the port city Quanzhou of Fujian province to cheer the Olympic torch relay. Aid workers say thousands of Myanmar cyclone survivors will die if they don't get help soon. Rival factions in Lebanon continue trading fire in an outbreak of violence has killed nearly 50 people. And Sudan breaks ties with Chad, accusing it of supporting rebels that attacked Khartoum. And Ja joins us at the business desk with all the latest business news. Hi. That's with the uh, CPI yes. released it this morning. Yes, the Consumer Price Index has come out. All eyes were on that. And it was at around expectation, which was 8.5%. That is the official CPI figure for the month of April year on year. That's according to the latest figures from the National Bureau of Statistics. Now, the figure compared with a growth of 8.3% in March and a nearly 12-year high of 8.7% growth in February was broadly in line with most forecasts. Well, China has set an annual target of 4.8% this year, and officials say they're still confident that that target is still attainable. Well, meanwhile, let's take a look at the markets now and how those are doing. We begin with Asian markets. And Japan's Nikkei share average fell on Monday, dragged lower by exporters like Canon on a firmer yen against the U.S. dollar. While financials were sold, and Japan's largest bank, Mitsubishi UFJ Financial Group, fell by 2% on rekindled concerns about the health of the financial sector following a massive loss by AIG. And basically, we have another one, a digital camera maker Canon, that lost 1% to 5,200 yen per share. Now, one bright spot was actually air conditioner maker Daikin Industries, which rose 3% to 5,210 yen. A report in the Nikkei Business Daily on Saturday said that group operating profit is expected to rise more than 10% to about 140 billion yen this financial year. It's been boosted by strong sales of energy-efficient commercial units in China 
and Europe. A very quick look at the trading figures this hour for you and everything um, mostly in negative territory. South Korea sold composite down 1.31%. Singapore Straits time basically flat. Well, the Hong Kong stock market is actually closed this Monday for Buddha's birthday. It will reopen on Tuesday, so we will take a very quick look at how the mainland numbers are doing. Well, the Shanghai Composite Index opened at 3,548 points. That was actually down 1.8% compared with Friday's closing figure. I will have a more updated information for you and a more full-length edition of the business update for the markets, but here we have the numbers for you very quickly. The Shanghai Composite is down 1.6%. 6% this hour. Shenzhen component is down 1.1%. B shares are also in negative territory, and overall, the large cap index is down 0.9%. It will be interesting to see how the CPI figure will affect those mar um, the market's movements, and that numbers will all be in our 2 p.m. edition of the show. Now, here is a piece of news that investors in mainland stock markets should be paying close attention to. The mainland has frozen stock accounts that it deems, quote, unqualified. The Securities Watchdog, which is, of course, the China Securities Regulatory Commission, said on Sunday that 120,000 stock accounts, which were not qualified, have been frozen as of today. Now, unqualified accounts have been defined as those that have been inactive for a certain length of time or do not have their paperwork in order, among other things. The account holder must go to securities companies in person to renew their accounts. Now, China on Sunday launched the first research center on World Trade Organization dispute settlements in Shanghai. The China WTO Dispute Settlement Mechanism Center has been established as China faces a number of trade disputes since its entry into the WTO seven years ago. The center is set to offer suggestions and solutions for these trade disputes for governments and businesses. Well, Chinese exporting enterprises have focused their efforts on European and American markets. But given the U.S. subprime crisis and, of course, the U.S. appreciation, the Ministry of Commerce is encouraging more investment in Eastern Asia at the two-day East Asia Economic Forum, which opened on Sunday. According to an estimate by the Asian Development Bank, many of ASEAN economies will grow by 5% this year. Investment by member economies account for 30% of foreign investment in the bloc, while Chinese investment in ASEAN countries accounts for only 4% of foreign investment in the bloc. Well, investment opportunities are mainly found in the infrastructure, agriculture, energy, and high-tech industries. ASEAN members have developed a number of preferential policies on foreign investment, hoping to lure more Chinese investments. Now, coming back to China, and the country's first commercial super jumbo company has just been launched in Shanghai. It's widely seen as a step forward in the country's quest to build its own passenger aircraft. Mark Dreyer has more. The China Commercial Aircraft Company Limited is a joint venture between the country's various aviation agencies with a total capital registration of 19 billion yuan. The company will be responsible for developing, making and marketing the first made-in-China jumbo jet. The state-owned Assets Supervision and Administration Commission is the biggest shareholder with an investment of 6 billion yuan. The second largest stakeholder is a conglomerate between the Shanghai Municipal Government, AVIC-1 and AVIC-2. One of the unique things about the China Commercial Aircraft Company is that our firm is a joint cooperation between the local government and the non-aviation enterprises. While drawing on China's own resources, international cooperation will also be sold. The new venture has not set out a detailed time frame yet, but it says its primary target right now is to overcome technical barriers and finally gain airworthiness approval from regulators. Big planes refer to giant transport planes with an overall weight exceeding 100 tons. These include planes used for civilian transport and commercial airlines with more than 150 passenger seats. Currently, the US, four European countries and Russia are capable of manufacturing these big planes. Europe's Airbus and the US Boeing are the only two firms in the international market. If we don't start RD now, it will be quite difficult to keep up with the industry later. 
because they keep upgrading and improving their engines and designs, and their fuel costs are also cheaper than us. Industry insiders say it's no surprise to see a country as large as China with ambitions to build its own large commercial jets. China hopes to save billions of dollars by not buying foreign planes. Statistics show the country will need around 2,400 jetliners over the next 20 years. While research and development for a large jet usually requires 10 years, experts believe the country still has a chance to roll out its own jetliners by 2020, which means the country will still be able to cater to booming domestic air travel demand, and the technology development will also improve China's own aviation industrial growth and manufacturing capabilities. Mark Dreyer, CCTV. Well, rice prices in Guangdong Province have stabilized over the past few days. Since the beginning of May, China's railway authorities have transported over 2.3 million tons of grain products from the northeast to other areas. 1.6 million tons of that went to the southern regions. Guangdong provincial authorities say that the region's rice prices have declined this past week, especially prices for domestic rice products. China's railway regulators say that May and June will see a total of 10 million tons of grain products shipped from the northeast to other parts of the country. And of course, with news like that, it may eventually help the CPI figure come down and to reach that level that the government is hoping for, which is of course 4.8 percent for the year. Now to some environmental news and China. China has released new rules for plastic bags, and they will come into effect in June. The move aims to crack down on one of the country's key environmental hazards. Deng Wei tells us how these standards will help protect the environment. The new rules require retailers to charge consumers for using plastic bags. They are also banned from handing out colored plastic bags. Authorities say those bags are mainly made of plastic that can harm the environment. The rules also require that the bags be at least 0.025 millimeters thick, so that it can be reused. Most plastic bags don't meet the minimum thickness standard. Most of those provided by supermarkets are only around 0.02 millimeters thick. Most countries around the world have begun banning free plastic bags. Ireland has even imposed an environmental tax on each plastic bag. The move has effectively cut the use of those bags. Experts say the eventual goal of China's new standards is to change consumers' shopping habits. It's estimated that China's people use up to three billion plastic bags a day. Experts say if everyone can use just one plastic bag a day, he or she can save around 300 bags a year, and that would mean as much as a two-thirds reduction in the use of plastic bags for the entire country. Don't worry, CCTV. Well, we should all try to use.、Um You know, cloth bag. Actually, I noticed you have a cloth bag. Yeah, which is called I'm not a plastic.、Bag. I know. I was looking at it like that's excellent. It's, it's,、yeah. really, it's a big bag. I'm telling you, viewers, big bag. It、yes. says it's not. I'm not a plastic bag. I hope bag. this fashion will go on.、Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it will. Well, that's it. Thank you so much, Donnie. Okay. Back to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, still to come on News Hour. The reconstruction of Beijing's historic Tiananmen Street south of Tiananmen Square is nearly complete. And fans celebrate as the Manchester United is crowned champion of the English Premier League.